Hey guys, Alicia here and welcome to another video. We have so much to talk about today and I'm really excited to share all of this with you. Today we are going to be talking about how I make money as an artist. I made a video about this about a year ago, but I wanted to update you guys and I also collected a ton of questions from you guys both on Instagram and here in the YouTube community tab and I want to answer as many of those questions as I can for you today. So you guys are going to see some sketching while I answer some questions. My last video that I did, I talked to the camera so you guys could see me, but I decided to do it this way instead this time around. I'm going to do my best to either add timestamps to the description of this video or see how I can section things out so that you will be able to jump around to specific questions and answers if that is something that you're interested in doing. But if you do want to hang out with me and stick around while I answer all of these questions, um, I've got a lot of things to cover. I'm going to be talking about my history as an artist and how I got into it professionally. I'm going to be talking about how much money I have made every year since I've started, how I got started, when I started selling art, how it, my different sources of income. We're going to be talking about a lot of things. The first thing I want to say is that every artist's professional journey will look different. So just because I'm doing certain things to make money doesn't mean that you have to do exactly those same things. It does take time to hone in on and find the things that you love to do. You may really, really love packing shop orders and being crafty and finding the best materials to use to make really beautiful aesthetic packaging. Um, I personally don't love that. I love having an online shop, but I've learned over time that there are other things that I love to devote my time to even more. So there are some things that will just get more of your attention and it's okay to make mistakes because that's how you learn. So it takes time to find a process that works for you. I'm still, my process is still changing. I'm still adjusting the things that I like to do and finding new things that I enjoy. So I don't think I'll ever get into a, I've been doing my job exactly the same way for 10 years or whatever. I don't think I'll ever get to that point because um, I want to live my life and I want to try new things and I have built a system that allows me to accommodate doing that. So, okay, let's go ahead and talk about where I'm at currently. At the time of recording this video, I currently have 145,000 YouTube subscribers, 52,000 Instagram followers, and 11,000 Skillshare followers with a total of 14 classes over on Skillshare. And I mentioned that because we're going to be talking about that platform quite a bit. This video, of course, isn't sponsored or anything, but I have been using Skillshare for a long time as a student and a teacher. I have been a full-time artist since July of 2017, so three years now. My current sources of income include Skillshare, YouTube, Patreon, my online shop, where I sell prints, stickers, and original paintings, and also various affiliate links. I'm currently an affiliate for Amazon, Arteza, Blick Art Supplies, and Peerless Watercolors, and Jackson's Art Supplies. So those are all of the sources from which I earn income right now, and we'll break that down a little bit later as far as um, which sources are the most profitable and how everything varies. The biggest question that I got from you guys was, how do I get started? Um, what do I do if I don't have an audience? And the first thing I would say is give yourself time to learn. If you jump into needing your art to make you money right away, it will not take long for you to hate doing it. This is what my art looked like when I first started making art and sharing it online back in 2016, July of 2016. This is what it looked like. This is what my art looked like in July of 2017 when I published my first Skillshare class and started my YouTube channel. So there was definitely a big jump from that first year into the beginning of the second year. And then this is what my art looked like when I sold my first painting, which was another six or seven months after having started my YouTube channel. So it was over a year and a half of sharing my art online before I even sold a painting. A big part of that for me was that I didn't start my YouTube channel for the purpose of making money. 
I technically didn't even start teaching on Skillshare because I wanted art to be my full-time job. I was already working, I already had a full-time job, and at the time my kids were like two and four-ish or so, and I had a full-time job and I was doing art on the side, and I was just so excited when my first Skillshare class, which was how to draw hands, did so well on the platform that maybe a month or two after having launched that class, I quit my job and focused on art full-time. Fortunately, at that time, my husband was also working full-time, so we weren't relying on my income. And I highly recommend just sharing who you are when you start and share your progress, share what you're learning, share what you're working on. It doesn't have to be beautiful and perfect and aesthetic when you're first getting started as far as building an audience, if you are seeking to build an audience. If you just want to get better at art, then I would say that you may not even want to stress yourself about posting your art online. I think that jumping right into, if I make art, it has to go on the internet, is another good way to hate what you do. Um, because then you put too much pressure on yourself to make things that are internet worthy or Instagram worthy or wherever it is that you share art. And it's okay to have art that you make just to learn and you, it doesn't have to end up on the internet for it to be real or to be valid. And specifically in the vein of sharing what you are doing, I, I say that because sharing what you're doing from the beginning keeps you honest. And if you're sharing what you're learning and how you're working on, the people who are like at a similar frequency, not necessarily a similar skill level, it doesn't have to be, but people who care about what you are doing will want to follow your journey. And that is how you find people who down the road will be willing to support you financially. You know, people who go, wow, I, I loved seeing how you made this or how you grew into this person and now I want to um, purchase a print or sticker or support you on Patreon or something like that. So being honest and being open makes people want to support you as a person because it's one thing just to like somebody's art and to give them a like or a comment and that is an entirely valid and so important aspect of supporting artists but when you're making that jump to financial support then it becomes a little bit more personal as far as the individual and someone saying I want to support you as a person that's part of the reason why I cherish getting to do this so much because there are so many of you who have said that that you want to support me as a person and that doesn't mean that you give financially but just being here um, means so much to me. Okay, I don't want to get too sappy. We've got a lot of stuff to talk about. So how did I start making money? I talked about this a little bit in, I believe it was the end of May, technically, of 2017. I launched my first Skillshare class and then I published a YouTube video to kind of promote that Skillshare class. At the time, my YouTube channel had maybe 100 subscribers and that was because I had been also previously making videos about miniature painting and board games. So I had a tiny audience there, um, about 100 people or so, most of whom did not care about watercolor painting, but that was the shift for me in my channel, um, moving into a different kind of art. So that was where I started, and YouTube started as being about building an audience as opposed to being about earning money. So I wanted to build an audience that I could share the things I was doing with. We'll talk more about how much money I made when I first got started very, very soon. And then when I wanted to experiment with selling stickers and prints and original paintings, I used Redbubble. It's so easy to use because you can just upload your designs and then choose what you want those designs to appear on. So you can do shirts and stickers and prints and mugs and pants and all kinds of things. And that can be as wide or as narrow of a variety of things as you want. The profit margin's pretty small, but it's a good way to get familiar with preparing files and scanning your artwork and how to get things going without also having to learn how to operate a printer and calibrate your monitor and get the colors right and how ink works and all of that stuff. So Redbubble is a good way to um, get your feet wet and there are other sites like that as well. I was also using Ticktail, which doesn't exist anymore, but I was using that as a hosting platform for original paintings. Etsy is another amazing platform, especially if you are selling things that are more searchable. So when people buy art from me, it's pretty much always, I'm assuming, because they know who I am and they like my art. On a platform like Etsy, 
you have a little bit more searchability. So somebody might go, I want an abstract watercolor painting, and maybe they'll end up at your art. Or they might go, I want a portrait of a dog, and they might end up at you. You know, you're more searchable, and Etsy is great for things like that. Another thing that is really, really important is I tried to set up for myself as soon as possible sources of active income and sources of passive income. And the difference between these two things, I cannot overstate how important it is to balance active income and passive income. So active income is sources of income that require your active attention, specifically like um, running an online shop. So when you earn money, you have to do something. So when somebody makes a purchase from your online shop, uh, however you are hosting that, you have to then pack that order and you have to ship it and you have to process all of that. That's active. Passive income is things like affiliate links. So when I post links in my videos to particular products, when you guys purchase from those links, I always say if there are affiliate links in the descriptions of my videos, so you know ahead of time, it doesn't cost you anything extra, but I earn a small commission um, from those sales that's passive income. So I don't have to do anything as far as packing orders. I just have to put the links in and those generate income over time. Things like YouTube and Skillshare can generate passive income as well. For example, I'm still earning money on Skillshare. It's actually the largest singular source of income for me. It makes up the biggest chunk of my income even now and I haven't made a Skillshare class in about eight months. And of course, my YouTube videos that I've made in the past, those are generating passive income for me as well. If as an artist, you choose to take on too many, like a too wide of a variety of active income jobs, you're going to overwork yourself. So if you say, I want to have an online shop where I sell prints and paintings, but I also want to sell watercolors, and I also want to have a YouTube channel where I make four videos a week, and I also want to, you can just set yourself up so easily with too many things that require your active attention, and you'll get burned out, you'll get tired. Hard work is a good thing, absolutely, and it's important and it's healthy to work hard, but putting yourself in a perpetual state of, I have to work 12 hours a day every single day, that's not fun, that's not good, that's not living life, you're just becoming a slave to a system that you probably didn't want to actually be in. And you can call it being an artist if you want, but I'm not really interested in being a slave to um, production or productivity or anything like that. So balancing those things, it does take time, of course. You're not going to put links somewhere and people are automatically going to click on them and start giving you money. It, it takes time. But that's why I say start slow and give yourself time. Don't quit your job today as soon as you watch this video if you already have one. And don't need your money and don't need your art to make money for you right now. So we talked a little bit about what do I do if I don't have an audience and I want to make money. My answer to which was give yourself time to share who you are before you need to make money. So how do you build an audience? How do you grow a following? I have a few tips about this. First of all, post regularly. If you're on Instagram, um, post often. If you can post once a day, that's great. I don't really recommend posting more than once a day, but it's good to post at least, you know, three to five times a week. Um, but at the same time, give yourself time if you need time away. I haven't posted on Instagram in a couple weeks now, um, and I'm doing that because it's healthier for me. Also, it's important to want to be a part of the art community. So connecting with other artists and leaving comments, but, 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 this is a big but, like a huge but. Don't just advertise yourself on other people's channels or profiles. That is one thing that doesn't necessarily make me angry. It just kind of disappoints me and makes me a bit sad when people on Instagram or in YouTube videos go, hey, I really like your art. I have a channel. You should come check it out. This is my channel. That It sounds harmless enough in theory, but imagine if you were in a restaurant, a burger restaurant, and somebody just walked into the restaurant and said, hey, you have really good burgers here, and then stood in the middle of the restaurant and said, I have a burger restaurant across the street, and everyone should come to my restaurant. That would be kind of rude, and it can seem similar 
for other artists and it seems disingenuous and not very sincere like the whole reason you were there in the first place was to promote yourself and it leaves a bad taste in the artist's mouth whoever you're you know leaving that comment on on their artwork or their video their content that they worked hard to create but it also i don't think it actually encourages people to want to know who you are what encourages me to want to know who other people are is sincerity and honesty. So I'm not talking about people who kiss up to me, who post on everything and say, you're the most amazing person in the whole world. That doesn't really happen, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about people who I'm like, wow, that was really thoughtful, or thank you for taking the time to say anything at all. And most of the time when people take the time to do that, I click on their profiles, I go to their YouTube channels, I want to see who is this person? Who is this nice person who's taken the time to be a real human with me? And that makes me want to know who people are way more than going, hey, I have a channel and I have over this many videos and you should come check me out. I, I don't like that. Um, and I know that some other artists feel that way as well. If you've done that in the past, please don't feel bad. Um, I'm not it's not my intention to make you feel bad, but I want to know you as a person. I don't want to know you as a, an advertisement. So just show me who you are as a person. Show everyone who you are as a person, especially if you're trying to build an audience. A community isn't just followers. It's other artists too. So it's not just about trying to get a bunch of people um, with you to follow you and to care about you. It's about realizing that as artists, we're all co-workers and we all work in the same office, even though our office is very, very large because it's the internet. Um, but we are all working towards the same goals. We don't have to be rivals or competitor competitors. I know I get jealous of my art friends all the time when I see them um, getting when I see them getting specific sponsors, even though I chose not to do sponsors on the channel, and they're working with particular companies or they're making really beautiful art, I get jealous of my art friends all the time. But I'm also so proud of them, and I think that that's the kind of attitude I want to nurture in myself and also be that kind of encouragement for other people when I can. If you're looking for an answer from me on how to beat the algorithm um, so more people will see your posts or how to get the most views on your YouTube videos, I can't really give you advice on that because I have never chased after algorithms. I'm not a rat race professional. I'm not the kind of person who is super ambitious going, I have to get as most views as I can and be as clickbaity as I can without getting called out for it. I'm, I'm not that kind of professional and if you want to be if you actually find joy in trying to find the most strategic way to get as many views or likes as you can if that makes you happy um, then i can't disparage you for that but it does not make me happy it just stresses me out and what i'm doing which is posting myself being honest being open being regular and checking in with you guys on a regular basis um, that's working for me. And as you'll see very soon, my income has been steadily increasing over the past three years. I don't think it'll just continue to increase forever and not every month is the same. But what I'm doing is working. So please don't feel like you have to try to get as many numbers as you can because it may take longer to get to certain places. There are some people who have been doing what I'm doing for way less time and have way more money or followers or subscribers to show for it than I do. And good for them. If that is bringing them fulfillment in their lives, I'm so happy for them. But for me, I found that working from home, it's so much more difficult to protect myself mentally and emotionally and to sustain my health in that way. And you have to listen to yourself. You have to constantly be kind of checking your own temperature and doing what's healthy instead of prioritizing, I have to be productive because it looks like everybody else is being productive. Okay, so how much money do I actually make? We're going to break it down from 2017 up through so far in 2020. So in 2017, I was a full-time artist for about half of the year and I brought in about $3,000 total for, you know, June through December of 2017. And about $200 of that was from YouTube. And about $3,000 of that was from Skillshare. And I spent about half of that money on supplies. So in 2017, I purchased an iPad for myself and maybe even a camera. 
and things like that. So I, and some Copic markers at the time. I was really interested in Copic markers. So I didn't make a ton of money starting out my first year, but I was immediately surprised by how well Skillshare worked for me as a teacher. This is really important. YouTube overall has been way more effective for me for building an audience. It's definitely been the greatest tool for growing my community is making weekly YouTube videos, but YouTube is definitely not the most profitable as far as sources of income. So we'll talk about that very soon when I break down some months for you. In 2018, we saw a jump. My total income, my, my gross income was $23,000 for 2018. That was a full year. And I had $6,000 in expenses. So I don't know, I guess $6,000 in expenses, if that seems like a lot, a lot of that has to do with um, in 2018, I believe I started a website maybe in 2018, so I had to pay for a domain and all of that stuff. I had to get a printer, I had to get paper and ink and all kinds of things, and I had to invest in a lot of stuff. And then of course, art supplies are always an investment. For me, I want my supplies to pay for themselves, of course, and I want to earn an income to support my family, but I am a lot more frivolous sometimes, I think, with finances than people might tell you to be. So we do save money, of course, we're not, I don't just spend money on everything, but I want my job to be fun. And sometimes my husband has to encourage me, but if there's something I'm really excited to try, especially if I know I'm going to make a YouTube video about it, I buy it. If I have the money for it, I buy it. So I do spend more money on things than you have to. So my expenses, generally speaking, are higher than they need to be, but this is my life and I want to enjoy it and I want to be excited about it and to share as much as I can with you guys. So every business expense is an investment for me in my happiness and in my content creation. So I'm not saying that money and materials equal happiness because they absolutely do not, but I want to have fun. I hope that makes sense. Um, in 2019, there is a big jump and my total income in 2019 was $60,000, but there was also a big jump in expenses and my total expenses was almost $14,000 in 2019. A big part of that was I purchased a second monitor for my computer and built a new computer and that was several thousand dollars and there's just lots of things over the course of a year like investing in materials as the shop continued to grow my online shop I needed to buy supplies more often I needed to try a bunch of different printer papers because I was having trouble and there was just there's a lot of things as your income grows the expenses grow as well because you have to keep up with all of that stuff in 2020 so far this year as of now it's the beginning of august now and as of this year i have made forty two thousand dollars and i have six thousand dollars in expenses so this year i have been actively trying to keep my expenses lower because my husband and i would really like to buy a house next year so we're trying to save as much money as we can so we're going a little bit more into saving mode this year and i would like to keep my expenses lower for the year. So to show you the breakdown of a month, let's take a look at the last full month that I have, which would be July of this year, 2020. So here's a breakdown of all of my income sources and the various percentages they make up of the total number. You can see over on the right here that my total income number for July was just over $7,000 and with expenses, it came down to about $6,800. It's really, really important for me to stay at this point that you shouldn't look at these numbers and go, if I'm not doing this, then you're failing or you're messing up or something like that. It took me three years to get to where I am. And if you would like to see some similar charts comparing a couple of months from this time last year, please do check out the video I made last year because you can see how those numbers have changed on a month to month basis over there. Let's look at another month from this year that I think it's really important to point out, and that's April of 2020. I'm sure many of us were affected, especially here in the United States around March with everything going on and the big thing happening. And I decided in the month of April that I was going to take the entire month off so that I could oversee my daughter's schooling because she was finishing up kindergarten and she was doing that from home and I wanted to do everything I could to support her during that time, which meant I did not work during the month of April. 
This is a chart showing my income from that month, because even though I didn't work, I still had income. There are two income sources missing from this chart, which would be Patreon and my online shop. During the month of April, I paused my Patreon and my online shop, and by doing that, what I was doing was pausing my active sources of income. Now, like I said, it's so important to have active and passive income because even though I took a break, I was still able to support my family financially while I took this month off because of the passive sources of income, specifically Skillshare, YouTube, and my affiliate income. So even though my income was half of what it was in July, I will also say that July's number, the amount of money I made last month, was high. It's higher than normal by close to $1,000. Um, I wouldn't say that that is the average. I definitely wouldn't say the amount I made in July is normal. It's above average, I would say, with the two major contributing factors of that being that my online shop did really well last month. And also, and also um, I added some new tiers to my Patreon, so that has been growing as well. And I have to say all of this with so much gratitude because you guys are literally making my dreams come true. It's because of you guys that I get to do what I'm doing and be with my family, save for our future. We've been increasing our charitable donations as a family lately. And yeah, you guys are, and even making video content like this, you guys are making all of the possible, whether you're watching a video or supporting me financially in any way. So again, thank you. I also want to take a second to briefly talk about taxes. Lots of you guys had asked about this. So for my husband and myself, since 2017, we have been seeing an accountant. And so we don't file our taxes ourselves. We see an accountant. So I can't tell you how to file your taxes, but I can give you a little bit of an estimate of what to expect. My husband and I are married, of course, so we file our taxes jointly, and the rule of thumb is to estimate about 20% of your income that you're going to have to pay in taxes. And of course, it's important to keep in mind that this varies depending on where you live. But where I am, if you are self-employed, we also pay taxes quarterly. So technically, if you estimate your income correctly, you pay your taxes quarterly, and then when you file annually, you won't owe any more money. But if you made more money than you were anticipating, you will have to pay more. If you made less money than you were anticipating, you will get money back. And that is specifically our accountant set up the number for us saying, this is how much you're going to pay every quarter. So depending on where our income sits at the end of the year, based on what was estimated, we either have to pay more or we get some back out of what we had already paid. But the general rule of thumb is about 20% of your income you'll have to pay in taxes. If you're filing your taxes on your own, um, you are much braver than I am, and I hope that you will be able to find more helpful information. The basics of what I can tell you is the income that you have to pay taxes on is not all of the money you make in a year, it's your taxable income, which is your profit. So to calculate taxable income, you take all the money you made in a year and you subtract any expenses. Whatever is left is that is the money that you have to pay taxes on. I hope that a little bit of information helps to get you started. I know it can seem really scary. If you can find an accountant who is reliable and affordable in your area, we've been seeing the same lady um, every year and she's amazing. And if you can do that, if you're able, I highly recommend it. When it comes to general accounting from home and keeping track of my income and my expenses, I use a program called FreshBooks. Again, not sponsored, but I've been using FreshBooks for like a year and a half now. It's a fantastic accounting software. Technically, it does more than what I need it to do. I just need a place to log all of my income sources as well as all of my expenses. I'm able to connect my business credit card here on FreshBooks and that automatically logs as an expense whenever I spend money on that credit card, which of course I only use for business transactions like reordering stickers or getting more supplies for my online shop. If I'm getting art supplies to try or test out or restocking on anything, that all goes on my business credit card and I can log all of my sources of income as they come in. And then at the end of the year, I can generate spreadsheets for tax filing purposes. And it's just a super useful program. It's not free. I do pay for it annually. That's also a business expense. Um, but it's been so, so helpful for keeping track of all of my income and all of my expenses. And I can see month to month, day by day, 
how the year is going, how the week is going, how the month is going, and I have a better idea of my money. My husband and I also have just a family budget, and we keep track of every dollar that we spend, whether it comes from his income or mine, it all goes into the same pool. So we keep track of every dollar that we spend on personal things and groceries and things for our children, all of it, it's all logged. And I think that's so important to have a budget. And I know that seems like a silly thing to mention, but super important, keep track of your stuff. A lot of you wanted to know whether or not you have to have a website. When you're first starting out, I don't think so. You can use your social media as your online presence to start. So when I first got started, I had an Instagram account. That was pretty much it for a year. And then it was just me sharing art. I wasn't really doing anything professionally. And then I had a YouTube channel. I didn't get a website until I wanted to have my own online shop. And then I wanted to have a place for more professional information to be housed. I think that Instagram, social media specifically, is a great way even if you get to a point where companies want to reach out to you. We'll talk about that soon. Just having a social media presence is very useful and I don't think you need to start with a website especially if you are selling items on platforms like Society6 or Inprint or even Etsy and you're shipping things out of your home um, I don't think that you need to stress about having a website to start um, your website is kind of like printing a business card on fancy paper so once you feel like you're financially ready for that um, more luxurious step in your business. It's a worthwhile investment and when you get to like a professional level It's a good idea to have a website so you have something Professional and presentable, but when you're first getting started and you're learning it sh definitely shouldn't be on your list of top priorities um, along with things like building a building an audience and a community and learning how to make art just wait on the website. It's definitely not an expense that you need to worry about starting out. I want to take a couple minutes to talk about selling merchandise as well. To give a little bit of a background, I print all of my prints from home. I'm now outsourcing my stickers because my cutting machine doesn't want to cut glossy paper anymore. So from home, I use my Canon PIXMA Pro 100 printer and I have an Epson V550 photo scanner. So I use the scanner to scan my artwork and then I print on my Canon paper. I'm using a ProMaster inkjet archival cotton watercolor paper to print my prints on and I'm using sticker app for all of my stickers and I've had really good experiences with those places so far. I did have to calibrate my monitor to kind of help get the colors right. It's a lot of trial and error in the beginning and it can feel really, really stressful um, trying to get prints to come out the way you want them to. If you're printing from home, I had issues when I would try to use inks that were not the name brand ink for my printer. So whenever I tried to save some money by using cheaper ink, it was just way too much of a headache because the ink quality just didn't work as well with the printer. So yes, printer ink is expensive. That's where printing companies make their money, not on the printer, but on the ink. So it does cost a lot, the ink, um, but it's worth it for me having a reliable product in that way. Another thing to keep in mind is that the products that every artist decides to sell will be different and will be individual to that artist. So there are some things that I don't do because I don't enjoy them as much. So I've never made like enamel pins. I would really like to do that someday maybe. And I don't really do much art for things like t-shirts just because my style currently isn't very illustrative and it's not super graphic, which is really what's better suited to those types of merchandise and that kind of products and it's okay if you are if you are a fine artist and you do a lot of paintings it's okay to just have prints you don't have to force yourself to do other things again the focus when you're building an audience is to have people who want to support you for the person that you are no it's not the get rich quick answer of trying to appease as many people or as many algorithms as you can um, but that's not the kind of advice that i can give you if that's what you're looking for um, i'm really more about not making myself crazy or very anxious or very depressed by doing my job again you have to find what is healthiest and works best for you and it's totally fine if your art changes over time I just recently took down a bunch of old shop listings from the past two years or so, like prints and originals that had been up on my shop for a long time, and the art that I was posting when I first started my online shop is pretty different from the art that I make now, and that's totally fine. You will change over time. 
When it comes to pricing artwork, we'll start by talking about originals. A general rule of thumb when pricing original paintings is to calculate the square inches of the piece of art, which is the height times the length. So if I make an 8 by 10 painting, that's 80 square inches, and then double that for the price. So an 8 by 10 original could sell for $160. A 9x12 original would be $216, a 5x7 would be $70. So that's a general gauge to give yourself, and there are some artists who will place their prices way higher. I've just found this to be a process that I like to follow so that I'm not massively underselling myself, and at the same time I can allow for wiggle room based on my own feeling and perceptions and the time I know that I put into each individual piece, and it can vary depending on the materials used. So it's good to have a little bit of a baseline to start from, but again, every artist's experience is going to be unique. And if you're really not sure, look at what other artists around your skill level are doing. How are they pricing originals and prints and stickers of similar sizes and quality to what it is you're thinking about doing? And you can kind of go from there. The most important thing I can recommend, especially in terms of merchandise outside of original paintings, like prints and stickers, is to calculate the cost and then see what your profit will be. Different products have different amounts of profit. For example, I sell sticker packs on my website. It's probably the top selling item on my shop are my various sticker packs. I sell a sticker pack for $10, which can cost $12 to ship domestically within the US, or a total of $14 with shipping internationally. So $12 or $14, depending on whether you're in the United States or somewhere else in the world, it costs me about $5 to produce a packed sticker sheet. And then if we take out shipping from that, um, my profit is about $5 per sticker sheet, but that does not include the time it takes to pack each sticker pack. I think I was saying sticker sheet, but I meant pack. So for each sticker pack, I have to get one of each sticker, put them in a bag, put a label on them that I format and print and cut myself, and then they have to go into an envelope with a backing paper and a postcard and a business card, and then I have to print shipping labels for them, put stamps on them, put a sticker on the back, and put them in the mailbox. It's a lot of time, it's a lot of steps, and I have to make sure that the money is worth the time that it takes. And that's so important, is making sure that you value your time. Let's contrast this with a print order. So prints I sell for $12 for a 5x7 print or $18 for an 8x10 print. The total cost of something like a print, even shipped, is closer to $2 per print. Maybe $2.50 with shipping and all of the other materials, but I sell those for anywhere between $17 and $20 shipped. If you take out the shipping cost of that and say $12 to $18 per item, the profit margin on a print is way higher than on a sticker pack. That being said, I sell way more sticker packs than I do prints, and that's just because stickers are a bit more versatile, so people are more likely to get a sticker pack, because you can put it anywhere, than they are to get a print, which you might have to frame or put it on a wall, and everybody has limited wall space, which is totally understandable. So every product is going to be a bit different, so calculate your costs and value your time. Those are my biggest pieces of advice when it comes to pricing artwork and merchandise. A few of you asked about the feasibility of YouTube as a source of income. I feel very, very fortunate in the amount of money that I make on YouTube currently. That being said, it's definitely not the largest source of income for me. Things that I put less work into oftentimes generate more income for me than YouTube does. So Skillshare, haven't done anything there as far as posting a class in about eight months, and I always make more money on Skillshare than on YouTube. And, at, and currently, that's the case with my online shop and Patreon, and sometimes even my affiliate income as well. I make more money from my other income sources than from YouTube. That being said, YouTube is so valuable to me because it's about community building and audience building. So YouTube is how I tell you guys about all this other stuff and how I am able to push income to affiliate links and Patreon and my online shop. Without YouTube, those other sources of income wouldn't exist. So 
while it on its own as far as ad revenue goes it's not my highest source of income it's sometimes even the place where i make the least amount of money on its own it is absolutely vital for fueling and giving life to my other sources of income because it's how i share things with you guys do you need expensive gear or equipment to make youtube videos specifically no you don't i think that if you have a decent phone camera and a mount like something that you could attach to a table to hold up your camera which you can get for like fifteen dollars and if you sit next to a window and you've got a mount for your phone you are going to be able to make really nice quality videos i mean most phone cameras these days can record um 1080p video and it's, I think it's really easy to do that. Editing software gets a little bit trickier. I use Adobe Premiere Pro, which is not the cheapest option. There is software that you can use to edit videos from your phone. There's such a, there's just such a wide variety of price ranges when it comes to editing software. I would definitely say that it's more profitable to invest in an editing software than it is to go, I need to buy a camera because then you're gonna need that software anyway. So if you're looking for something to invest in to start, I think it's more important to have a reliable editing software than it is to try to buy a fancy camera for recording videos or for taking pictures, especially if you have like a decent phone from like the last five years. A lot of you guys were curious about making what you love versus making what's popular. And hopefully we've talked about this a bit before because I'm all about making what I love. And at the same time, there can be an excitement to making things that make other people happy. It doesn't have to be an entirely toxic or draining thing. It can allow people to get excited together. So when you guys tell me that you really like gouache videos, or you really like paint making, or you really like the limited color palette series, it makes me more excited to do more of those things because you guys love them. In the same way, if people really like particular types of art, um, it can be exciting to make those things because it builds community, it builds excitement, it brings people together, and if that is what you're experiencing in making things that people love, then you should run with that because it's amazing. But if it's just stressing you out, take some time back and focus on what you love, and the people who love what you love are more likely to support you anyway. I mean, if people just think you're making cute art, but you don't actually care about it, they're not going to care about you, and they're probably not going to support you financially. So do what you love, and if you love doing what people love, then you're doing that, and it, and it works. Hopefully that makes sense. I also got a few questions about Patreon. When should you start Patreon? I originally launched a Patreon account in January of 2018, so about six months after I started my YouTube channel, I had maybe a thousand YouTube subscribers, and the general rule of thumb with Patreon is about 1% of your audience will go from your YouTube channel or from your follower base and support you on Patreon. That's what I've found and that's what I've heard. So about 1% of a 1,000 people is 10 people. And that was pretty much what I had. I had 10 people on Patreon. The issue with that, while I was extremely grateful, it was not a very large sense of source of income, maybe $20, $30 or so a month. But depending on the tiers and rewards that you offer from Patreon, if you're doing digital downloads, real-time videos, exclusive vlogs, um, sketchbook scans, PDF, things like that, sometimes you can be doing the same amount of work for 10 people as you would for 100 people. If there are two people who are paying for a monthly real-time video, it's going to be just as much work as if I was making that same video for 50 people. The same thing comes down to a sketchbook PDF. If there's only one person at that tier, I still have to do that work, and it's the same amount of work as if I was doing it for a thousand people. So I think it's important to build an audience before trying to make Patreon work. Um, my Patreon, I actually ended up shutting it down after a couple of months because it wasn't worth the stress financially. I was so grateful and I will always cherish that time of those first 10, 15 patrons who were supporting me um, when my audience was much smaller. And I'm so grateful. I know some of you were still around and thank you so much for that time. It was amazing and I will always cherish it. I restarted my Patreon 
a year later, a year and a half almost, in April of 2019, and um, jumped right into making about $200 a month on Patreon when I started. And now that I have a larger audience, I've been able to integrate regular reminders about Patreon and my shop and YouTube memberships into the channel without it being obtrusive or annoying, and that has grown to currently about $1,300 a month on Patreon. And that's taken over a year to go from $200 to $1,300. But having that audience space and being genuine with you guys has made that way more profitable, way more efficient, and I'm having so much more fun because we have more of a community and I'm able to engage with you guys and do more with you. That kind of leads right into time management. So here's a quick rundown of my weeks. I publish new videos every Thursday and my schedules throughout the week is kind of focused around YouTube. So videos go up on a Thursday. I film and work on videos. I start filming on Friday and I try to have the video done, processed and edited and uploaded to YouTube by Tuesday. So Friday, Monday, Tuesday, those are video making days, which means that my patrons and YouTube members have two days of early access to all of my videos, which is part of my Patreon rewards. And then that gives me Wednesdays and Thursdays to work on other things. That means I'm working on fulfilling Patreon rewards, just taking time to relax and do art, catching up on administrative emails, replying to comments, planning for future videos. Wednesdays and Thursdays are when I work on things that are not YouTube. That being said, I work on average, usually when I'm at full production, I work between four to six hours a day. I don't work full eight hour days because I'm a mommy and I'm a human being with anxiety and uh, I have found that I am much more comfortable with shorter work days and I have built a system that accommodates that. Um, uh, that was another thing you guys had asked is how I do the job that I do with kiddos. And a big part of that, I do have two kids, by the way, if you didn't know, they are almost five and seven. They both have birthdays coming up in September. And um, my husband also works from home. He does web marketing and he and I are able to work together and to get the things we do done together. My father-in-law also works from home here and we all live together. So we have three amazing, loving grown-ups who are able to give our kids the time and attention that they need during the day. I know that's not everybody's situation and I know that home life is different for everyone, but I'm so grateful for what we have here. And also shorter work days is a huge part of that for me. If I was forcing myself to work eight to 12 to 14 hours a day, um, my family would suffer because of that. Um, there were times when I first got started when I was working longer days and it was really stressful for a while and that early time allowed me to build things like my library of Skillshare classes, my library of YouTube videos, and all of the links and associated things with that that allow me to have shorter work days now. So it took a lot of time to build what I have now, um, but it's important to be mindful when you're starting out to go, what is my long-term goal? And you may have to work hard in the beginning to get to that goal. I also pack orders twice a week. So on Monday mornings and on Thursday mornings, I pack shop orders. Every week is different with my online shop, especially depending on how much I promote and mention the shop in videos or on Instagram. So some weeks I might have no shop orders or one or two shop orders and then other weeks I might have 20 or more shop orders and it just varies. It depends um, from week to week. It varies a lot. Stickers generally tend to do really well for the shop. A lot of you guys had also asked about working with other companies. For pretty much all of the companies that I have worked out that I have worked with, they've reached out to me. The best information that I can give is I started hearing from more companies when my channel got to around 30,000 subscribers. The exception to that is probably Arteza. They reached out to me sooner when I was closer to, I don't know, just a few thousand subscribers. And I've been working with them for a really long time and that's been a lot of fun. When it comes to companies reaching out to me to test art supplies, it happened around 30,000 um, YouTube subscribers and maybe around 10,000 Instagram followers. So once your numbers start to grow and once you get to those points, companies start to see you as a more viable advertising option. 
When it comes to sponsors on YouTube, as you all probably know, I don't do sponsorships on this channel anymore, but there was something that must have triggered when I hit 100,000 subscribers, because once I hit that number, I was getting contacts from, if you think of a, a sponsor that you see on lots of different videos, and I was getting contacts from them. I was getting emails, and it was actually a lot of third-party companies that represent a bunch of different sponsors that were trying to match me with a sponsor um, for YouTube. YouTube videos and that was again around 100,000 YouTube subscribers. Hopefully those numbers are helpful. They are not things that I need or that I heavily prioritize for my job. They're just things that I get to be really grateful for when I have the opportunity to work with companies, to test art supplies, hopefully to build long-lasting meaningful relationships with small business owners and other professionals. Um, yeah, that's been my experience so far. I talked about this already, but in terms of the most popular products versus the most profitable products, stickers have definitely been the most popular. So stickers are items that more people can use because like I said, they're more versatile, um, but they have the lowest profit margin of everything that I offer in my shop. So I make, so I make the least amount of money from stickers. I want to say that original artwork must be the most financially profitable. It's hard to say because of course original artwork takes the most time because you have to paint it and there's only one of them. Um, you know, then you have to calculate the time it takes to make a painting. I definitely feel um, the happiest when somebody buys an original painting. It just feels like this extra special precious thing that I get to send to someone. An original painting, I feel that way about shipping everything, but originals definitely have a very special place in my heart. I have been recording this voiceover for so long and I've attempted to compile a lot of information for you guys, but I want the comment section of this video to be a continuation of the discussion. So if I haven't answered your question or if I haven't answered your question fully, please do ask me down in the comments and if you know the answer to someone else's question, you can answer it. You guys have been amazing about helping each other with that stuff, but I will also do my best to answer as many questions as I can. Um, my goal here was to share my experiences with you guys. I also wanted to make a quick note and say that August has been a really slow month for me as far as work goes. I've not been working very much this month. I'm averaging like an hour of work a day. I'm just feeling emotionally very overwhelmed. There's a lot of personal stuff going on right now. We're okay. We're safe. Um, but there's a lot of stuff going on right now, as I'm sure there is with so many people, but I'm so grateful to you guys for giving me the opportunity and the platform and the space to share information like this with you. I hope it's been helpful. I want to say a huge thank you. I hope it means so much more now after having seen what I've been through and how things have grown in the past three years. Thank you to my patrons and my members here on YouTube. You can check out those platforms if you're interested in any of the stuff I've talked about in this video. Um, you guys are you guys are making the dream real. So thank you. Thank you for joining me for this video. I hope you have enjoyed it. I hope it has been helpful. And I will talk to you guys next time. I love you. Bye-bye.